Hi there everyone. This video is a continuation of my series on motor testing and today we're going to be looking at something a little bit different than just torque, thrust and responsiveness. Today we're going to be looking at motor heating and how to choose a motor that's going to stay cool for your application. And this is particularly relevant for people who fly cine whoops or cine lifters or other heavily laden quads where it might not be that the size of the motor is the limiting factor in terms of the torque and responsiveness that it can provide, but rather that heat is the limiting factor and you need to pick a motor that's going to be able to stay cool while it's lifting and moving these heavier cameras. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. It's a big topic, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. Up until now, when we've been talking about sizing a motor, we've been talking about typical freestyle quads and ultralight quads. And in this application, sizing the motor is all about the torque that that motor has and what torque is required to control the prop that you want to spin. The torque of the motor is really important to accelerate and decelerate the prop rapidly so that the flight controller can really quickly change the thrust produced by each of the four motors to keep the quad stable in the air. For this application, torque can be approximately determined directly from the motor state of volume. Larger motors with more state of volume generate more torque, and we can see why this is by looking at the equation for torque. So torque is the force times distance, so the force exerted by the motor on its rotor, multiplied by the radius of that rotor. The force can be determined by the magnetic field strength B times the area over which that field acts. Now, in a motor like we use, an outrunner motor, the area over which the magnetic field acts is this curved blue area, so the curved outside area here. And that area is 2 pi times the radius of the stator times the height of the stator. So that gives us our force. And we multiply that by the distance over which it acts, which is again the radius of the stator. And that gives us 2b pi r squared h. And you multiply all these terms together. Now pi r squared h is interesting because pi r squared h is also the volume of this cylinder, the stator volume. So another way that we can write the torque of the motor is twice the magnetic field strength times the volume of the stator. Now, when we talk about volume, a lot of people ask me, well, what about the volume of the bearing? And what about the volume of the non-functional parts of the stator? Well, if we look at how we've actually come to this equation, we've not considered what's inside this stator at all. All we're talking about is the outside curved area multiplied by the radius over which that force that the motor is generating acts. So provided that the stator is well designed, as in it can generate sufficient field strength to match the field generated by the permanent magnets, then really we can just look at the state of volume as being the key differentiator between the motors. In general, a taller, narrower motor is going to be more responsive than a wider motor. As you make the motor wider, you do increase the amount of torque because this R value gets bigger. But you also increase the moment of inertia of the motor. So that motor which has more torque also has more rotational mass to try and spin up and spin down. If you make the motor taller, you also increase the torque, but you don't increase the moment of inertia by the same amount. So a taller, narrower motor has a better ratio of torque to moment of inertia than a wider motor. So in general, these taller, narrow motors are more responsive and better for these freestyle and ultralight applications. Using this equation, we can create this graph of the suitable motor volume versus prop diameter for a three-bladed prop. So you can see here we have prop diameter in inches along the bottom and various points on here for different size motors, along with a curve for a size of motor that should be sufficient for spinning that size of prop if it's got three blades. So you can pause the video here and see what motor might be suitable for a different size prop, provided it's a three-bladed prop. 
I've also produced a graph for two bladed props, which are more typically used on ultralights. So if you're interested to know what size of motor is right for spinning a two bladed prop, let's say, you know, a five inch two blade prop, then again, you can pause the video and look at this chart. In general, motors that are higher up are gonna have more torque and have better control over the prop, and motors that are lower down are generally gonna be smaller and therefore a bit lighter. But as long as you don't stray too far from this dotted line, you should end up with a motor that's really able to control that prop really well. When it comes to sizing motors for Cinewoops, things get a little more complicated. A small quad that's carrying a heavy camera is often limited by motor heating rather than torque. You've got a relatively small prop, so you wouldn't need a very large motor in order to control that prop really effectively. But if you pick a motor that's too small, that motor just gets way, way too hot and overheats. So I've decided to undertake some testing to look at the relationship between motor temperature and motor size and shape so that we can better understand how to size motors for these types of applications where the size limit is due to motor heating rather than torque and responsiveness. So I tested a number of motors all across this sort of three inch, three and a half inch Cinewoop size. And I produced this chart, which I think is, is the chart that I found most illuminating. If you run a motor for three minutes at a certain thrust level, so you're producing, let's say, 90 grams of thrust, or you're producing, I don't know, 410 grams of thrust, but you're producing that amount of thrust for three minutes, what temperature does the motor bell end up at after that three minute test? So you can see for all the motors that I tested, as you demand more thrust, they get hotter, which makes perfect sense. You're needing to run them at a higher throttle, you're dissipating more power, and the motor's gonna heat up more. And you can also see that the amount of thrust that the motor can produce before it reaches 60 degrees really depends on the motor size and shape. So over on this left-hand side, we have small motors. They get very hot, producing even a small amount of thrust. Whereas larger motors with much more surface area can produce a lot more thrust without getting too hot. So what can this information tell us about the performance of the motors? Well, this graph here shows the power that was needed to be delivered into the motor for its surface temperature to reach 60 degrees. And we can see that there's a strong correlation of this power with surface area. And this allows us to be able to specify and choose a motor for a particular application. We can easily work out the average power that's gonna be dissipated in the motor during a flight by considering the capacity of our battery and the length of the flight. So as an example, I have a 6S 1100 milliamp hour battery and we're gonna be flying it for five minutes before it's empty. And in that case, we can take the voltage of the pack multiplied by its amp hour rating, so 1.1 in the case of an 1100 milliamp hour pack, multiply that by 3600, which is the number of seconds in an hour, and divide it by our flight time in seconds. And that gives us an average power dissipated into, that, into those four motors of 300 watts. And if we divide that by four, we get an average power per motor of 75 watts. And if we take 60 degrees as being the maximum surface temperature that we're comfortable with for the motor, that allows us to look at these motors and make a decision about which ones are gonna be suitable. So here's about 75 watts, and we can see that anything to the left of this line is going to be a motor that's going to get hotter than 60 degrees on its surface, and therefore is probably not suitable. But any of the motors to the right are able to dissipate more than 75 watts of power and not overheat. So we could look to be picking a 1504 on the very smallest side, or going up to something like an 1806 or a 2104, and we've got plenty of headroom here. You can see that these motors that can dissipate much more power, 135, 140, 160, these are potentially overspecified for what we need. They have more surface area than we need. And we're gonna talk later about why you might not want to pick a motor with much, much more surface area than you need.
But what if you don't know what the average power that you're going to be delivering into your motors is? Perhaps you don't know what the flight time of your Cineweep is going to be on any particular battery. Well, we can also look at this in terms of thrust. So if you're cruising with a 700 gram all up weight Cinewoop at a camera angle of 35 degrees, you can work out the amount of thrust that you're going to need by taking the weight of the Cinewoop and dividing by the cosine of your camera angle. In this case, we need 808 grams to cruise 35 degrees and maintain altitude. This is 202 grams per motor, and we can work it out by looking at this graph which motors are going to be suitable. So we can see that now this 1504 motor is right on the borderline of being acceptable and maybe we wouldn't want to use it. We want to move to something a bit larger, like a 2104 or an 1806 size or even a 2005. Again, these very, very flat motors, the 2203 and the 2303, have other drawbacks. So we're going to talk about that now. But you can see that we can choose a motor based on its surface area for the amount of thrust that we need that motor to deliver. What are the conclusions that we can draw from this? In applications where motor heating is going to be the limiting factor, it's motor surface area rather than motor volume, which I think is the key parameter. Very wide pancake star motors like these 2203s, 2303s do have issues though. So you can't just make the motor very, very wide and very flat in order to give it lots of surface area because it ends up with poor responsiveness. It has a lot of inertia for the amount of torque that it can generate and they can suffer from desyncs as a result. In my experience, a width to height ratio of between 3 to 1 and 5 to 1 gives the best performance. So a 3 to 1 would be something like a 2107 and a 5 to 1 would be something like a 2004, where the, the ratio of the width to height is 3 to 1 and 5 to 1 respectively. In general, Cinewoops are going to benefit from flatter, wider motors, more like that 5 to 1 ratio, which have this larger surface area for their volume and therefore stay cooler, particularly when you're demanding a lot of continuous thrust, a lot of continuous power from them. And that's why I would recommend motors like this 2205 or 2004 for a 3.5 inch Cinewoop because they're relatively wide, so they do stay nice and cool, but they're not these pancake motors that are very, very wide and flat, which have issues with responsiveness and desyncs. So as with anything in engineering, it's a trade-off. You want to go for a slightly wider motor for a Cinewoop, but not too wide. I hope you enjoyed this initial look at motor heating for Cinewoops. If you fly a Cinewoop, I need your help to dive more deeply into this topic. There's a card floating around up there. If you could click that card and fill in a Google form, just says how heavy your Cinewoop is, what the prop size is, what motor you're using, how hot it is where you fly, and how hot your motors feel when they come down after a flight, if you could fill out those boxes, I can crowdsource that information and hopefully I can produce a really nice graph showing how hot different sizes of motors get for different weights of quads. And that will help give some recommendations as to what size of motor is best for different Cinewoops. If you could fill that out, if you do fly Cinewoop, I would really appreciate it. That's all I have for you for today. I hope that you've enjoyed the announcements and enjoyed the video. If you have, hit that like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. But until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.